Today I'll teach you about 2D vectors by coding this thing in JavaScript. You'll learn to use both the Cartesian and polar representations, and do vector operations like addition, subtraction, scaling, normalization, and how to calculate the dot product. I hope you'll code along with me, because I'll teach you how to use what we learn about vectors to draw vectors using JavaScript. It's so weird, it's like the chicken and the egg or the bird and the pig. Get it? Because Angry Birds uses vectors to... No, 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 no! Gonna code, debug, and have fun. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Gonna prototype and design. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Let's code now. Let's begin with basic HTML. And I'm doing the bare minimum here because this is not going to be a real application. It's just us studying math. So let's define the canvas 500 by 500 pixels and give it a background color. Let's make it red this time, dark red. I'm going to close the canvas element, save, refresh. This is our canvas element here, but uh, let me remove this border for the body and these scroll bars here. So I'm going to go here and start defining the style. Close the tag as well, and the body will have a margin of zero and an overflow of hidden, like this. Now, if we refresh, this canvas fits here perfectly, my small screen. It's time to start writing JavaScript. So I'm going to do this in a script tag here. I'm closing it so I don't forget. And I will write it non-indented like this. So I'm not going to use external files in this video. First thing we do is access the canvas context, like this, the 2D context. And let's define a point at 90 and 120 x, y coordinates. And let's draw this point. We begin a path. Let's give it a white fill since the background is dark. And uh, I'm going to use the arc to draw a circle at the x and y location of the point with a radius of 5 and from 0 to math pi times 2 radians, a full circle. Let's fill, refresh, and this is our point right here. We are going to reuse this code later, so I'm going to extract it as a function to draw point, given a location, a size, so here, radius was 5. I'm going to have a default value for the size 10. So then the radius will be half this size. And the color, let's have it white by default. So here, I'm going to indent everything inside of this function and replace the point, the global point, with the location, the radius with half the size, and the white color with this parameter. And now I can just call here draw point point. I don't need to specify the other parameters because they have default values. If I refresh, everything still works as before. Now this situation here with zero zero in the top left corner is bad because I want to be able to draw negative coordinates as well. And this just won't let me. So I will offset everything by half the canvas width and height. I'm going to go up here and define an offset equal to half the canvas width and half the canvas height, like so. And uh, I'm going to translate context with these offset properties. I'm going to save, refresh, 
And now this point is relative to the center screen here, 90 to the right and 120 downwards. That's how the Y coordinate goes on a computer. Let's draw this coordinate system as well so it makes things clear. I'm going to write here begin path and then I move to minus the offset and then line to the width of the canvas minus the offset x and then this is going to be the horizontal line. I also want a vertical line which is similar but with offset y and the canvas height minus the offset y like this. And let's stroke and refresh. This is now the coordinate system, but I want it to look a little bit more styly. So I'm going to go up here and use a line dash. Line dash with five pixels for the dash and four pixels for the spacing. And let's set a line width of two but I'm going to add a stroke style of red. So let's save this and refresh. And I'm happy with this. But I should remember this set line dash to reset it afterwards. Otherwise, it's going to affect many things that I'm going to draw later on. And um, let's extract this as its own function as well. Let's call this draw coordinate system and indent everything here one to the right i'm going to call this function as well otherwise nothing happens and let's move the code down where our drawing functions are so everything still works but the code is now nicer and i just see here at the top that i'm translating drawing the coordinate system and our point now this point here is a point, it has an x, y coordinate, but it's also a vector because vectors have two ways of possible representation, a Cartesian way, this one with the x, y, and a polar way. The polar gives you the distance from here to the zero, zero point. It's also called the magnitude. So if you know the distance and also this angle, also called the direction, then you can define the same point in another way. So let's try to play also with this polar representation of the vector next. I'm going to implement a function for computing the magnitude or the distance to the zero, zero coordinate like this. So given a point, and I'm just going to use object destructuring here and say, x, y directly. I don't want to put p, x, p, y everywhere. So I return the hypotenuse of x and y. It's as simple as that because there's no difference this time. So I'm still applying the Pythagorean theorem to get the hypotenuse in this triangle, but one of the points is at zero, zero. So that's the magnitude. And let's log it here. So I'm going to log it in the console, the magnitude of the point, just to see what it is. I will refresh and it's 150. And if you do the math, then that's correct. That's why I chose here 90 and 120, because it gives us a nice round result. So applying the Pythagorean theorem to get this distance gives us 150. Let's add interaction next. I'm going to go here and make that point draggable using the mouse. So I'm going to write document on mouse move. And here I'm going to write an arrow function and I will set the coordinate, the x coordinate to event.x and the y coordinate to event.y. So depending on the information in the event, I will update the point accordingly. And then we update. We update. This is going to be a function that we are going to implement now. So every time our 
mouse moves, we want to clear whatever was on the canvas previously. So I'm going to clear rect starting at minus offsets. And then the width and height of this rectangle will be the width and height of the canvas. Like this. And here, I'm going to indent everything inside of this update function like so. I also want to, well, let's refresh. So now you don't see anything because this update is never called, but as I am moving the mouse, it starts to happen. And looks like I forgot to consider the offset when moving the point. So it should be where my mouse is, not offset by, well, the offset. So I'm going to go here and say minus offset.x and here minus offset dot y. And now this is proper, but I still want to see something every time I refresh the page. So I'm calling update once. I have something on the screen and as I'm moving my mouse, that value is changing. Both the location of the point, but also that magnitude. Look at it. It's getting zero almost zero if i could put it exactly there it would be zero but my handling is horrible uh, now it's zero <laughs> and if i go further away um, it increases so it's just the distance to the center let's get the direction as well so next to our function for getting the magnitude i'm going to implement a function for the direction or the angle and depending on our points location x, y, I will just return the value of the arc tangent of y divided by x. So this should be familiar if you've watched my video on trigonometry. Basically, we get the ratio of sine divided by cosine here. And then using the inverse tangent, the arc tangent, we are getting the actual value of the angle in radians. Let me go up here, copy this one, and change this magnitude to the direction as well. And actually, let's make these logs a bit nicer and say here, magnitude and direction. Like this. So let's refresh. And we have something there. We have the magnitude as before, but also the direction. Notice here it's pretty much zero when I'm on this x-axis. And as I'm going down, this increases all the way to 157. So this is half of 3.14 of uh, pi. 90 degrees is half pi. So these, the magnitude and direction, are the polar coordinates of the same point. And let's have a function that does that nicely for us. I'm going to write here to polar from x, y, and I'm just going to return both of these things, the direction and the magnitude. And here where we are testing, I'm just going to use object destructuring, get this magnitude and direction from calling to polar on our original point specified in x, y. So mag and dir here are going to be exactly the same as here. But uh, now we can call this to polar function and the code is much nicer this way. I'm going to refresh and everything is as expected. Now, of course, changing into polar coordinates like this is doable. The reverse is also possible. So I'm going to go here and show you how to get the same value back again from these magnitude and direction. So I'm going to define here same, <laughs> something to keep the same value in. And then let's call a new function to x, y, given a magnitude and direction. And let's draw this same point with a smaller size, maybe six, 
and a color of red. So we can see it on top of this white point somehow, like a small dot. Now this xy, 2xy function is going to be here, taking the magnitude and direction in an object. So we still pass that combination here. And we are going to return for dx the cosine of the angle of the direction multiplied by the magnitude. So cosine is between minus 1 and 1. But when we're multiplying it by this magnitude, we are essentially scaling it. So it goes back to the original location. And the same for the y with the sine instead. Now let's refresh and look at this point. We have that white point there and the red small dot in the middle. So that's the same value that we get back from converting back to the Cartesian space, to the xy space. There's the problem. You see what happens here? Something very weird. This a tan function here that gives us the angle, it gives us an angle between minus half pi to plus half pi. And we don't want that. We want to extend so it goes between minus pi and pi, the full 360 degrees. And that's why there is another function in the math library called a tan 2. It gives us that. But the parameters are different. We don't put the ratio here. We have to specify each value independently, starting with the y and then the x. So I'm going to save this, refresh, and now that red dot is always in the middle of the white bigger dot. So in this way, you make it work in all cases. I'm going to add a link with differences between a tan and a tan 2, so you can study if you want. But let me now remove these logs from here. They're not needed anymore when we have this nice uh, way to visualize the result. We know it works. And next, I want to teach you how to draw an arrow using what we have learned about vectors so far. So let's call here a function. We will implement this function soon. And this will be draw an arrow to the point like this. So from the 0, 0 to the point. And this draw arrow function, it's going to have a parameter here for the tip. So the location where the tip of the arrow is later will play with the tail as well. So let's give a default color of white and the default size of, say, 50. And I'm going to start by drawing a simple line. So let's do begin path, move to 0, 0, line to the tip. And let's set the stroke style to the given color and stroke. Right, I'm going to save, refresh, and now there's a line drawn to our point. But let's get here the polar coordinates of this point, of the tip. So I'm going to write the direction and magnitude to polar of the tip xy. And now I'm going to calculate a new vector where I'm going to change the direction a little bit. So the direction will be the given direction of the tip plus half pi, so 90 degree offset. And the magnitude, I'm just going to set it to half this size. So somehow consider the tip of the arrow as being kind of like a radius. So with this, we are going to convert back V1 into a new point in Cartesian space. So P1 is going to be 2xy of V1. And let's draw this new P1 point and see what we get. I'm going to save this, refresh, and look at that. This uh, I can't really point to it, but you probably see what I'm talking about. That other point there is an offset of 90 degrees from 
the line that I'm drawing with my mouse. And it's always 25 pixels away from 0, 0. But I would like this to be at the tip. So I'm going to go here and translate this P1 point to a new point, T1, which has the coordinates same as P1, but translating, adding the tip XY to them. Like this. And I don't want to draw P1 anymore, I want to draw T1, which is this new point. And now you see this point has moved very close to the future tip of the arrow. I want it actually to be closer to the line. So I will modify this value here to be something like pi times maybe 0 0.8, like this. Yeah, that's good. And I'm going to make another one symmetric on the other side as well. So let's copy all this stuff. Probably you see where I'm going with this. But with the two here instead. And here I'm going to subtract this value. And you can almost see the arrow now. Now, one thing my students do is repeat code like this. And this is bad. We need to extract this as a function. And it's a clearly defined function. It's the addition operation of vectors. We are adding two vectors, p1 and tip, p2 and tip. We can actually write this here as add p1 tip and the same here or p2 and the tip. And I'm going to go here and implement this add function real quick. It's really easy, same as before. So given two vectors, p1 and p2, I will return a new vector with p1x plus p2x and p1y plus p2y. So let's save this and refresh and everything still works. But now I want to draw that arrow in a nice way. So let's remove all these points that are being drawn there. So draw point T2, draw point T1. And actually, I don't want to draw these up here either. I just want to draw the arrow to have everything neat. And here, after we draw this line, we begin some other shape. So let's begin path, and I'm going to move to the tip. And line 2, first to T1, then line 2, T2, and then close the path. This is going to go back to the tip, essentially. Now I want to stroke set the fill style also to the color because I want the arrow to have a fill and fill as well. So let's refresh and look at that arrow. It's quite big. <laughs> I, I don't like it. So let's make it smaller. Let's set the default size of maybe 20 and refresh this. That's more like it. So this is one vector that we are now controlling with our mouse, its properties. Let's define another one and try this draw arrow function again. So I'm going to go all the way here at the top and define maybe a gravity vector or, or something like that. G is equal to 0 on the x and 50 on the y, like so. And let's draw this G as well. So here we're drawing the point. Let's draw G using another arrow, and that's going to be more boring because it's always going to be pointed downwards like that. But uh, it is what it is. Now, let's try to play again with this add function for adding vectors and uh, see how it looks like in the result. So maybe I'm going to calculate here a result of adding the point and G. So let's say maybe constant and then the result of addition is equal to add 
point and g like this and let's draw arrow result add refresh and this is now the addition of the two vectors you can kind of see that the gravity vector fits right where my mouse cursor is and then after drawing it there somehow the new result vector that's where its tip is going to be let's try to draw an arrow there with the tail where my mouse is so basically we need here another parameter that says where the tail of the arrow is going to be this is going to change things a little bit because now we need to specify here every time we draw an arrow that we want to start at zero zero and then say where the tip is going to be so this here is the tail and this here also is the tail but i would like to draw another arrow from the point where my mouse is to this result of the addition we need to change here the move to to consider tail.x and tail.y as well and now if i refresh there are many things that are happening uh, and the visualization is not very good at this stage i'm going to emphasize this last line that we drew by drawing all the other ones with red so this is going to make all the other ones except this last one that we just added less emphasized because the color is closer to the background color let me refresh and now you can see what we have here so we are drawing this line from the mouse location to the result of the vector addition but that tip of the white arrow is weird it's not considering the direction of that small arrow there it should and that's where vector subtraction comes in i'll show you here where we are using the tip we need to consider somehow the tail as well where is this line starting at and i'm gonna do that by calling here subtract the tip and then the tail so subtracting the tail from the tip this subtract is going to be a very simple function it's actually the same as the add function but subtract because here we're going to use minus let's refresh and now you see this small arrow correctly there and let's modify this g actually because now it's kind of boring going downwards but let's say it's going also a little bit to the right it's not gravity anymore maybe some gravity combined with wind or whatever and you can see now the white arrow has the same orientation as this gravity here in the beginning now one thing that you need to know is that this white arrow here and the gravity arrow they are not two different vectors they are the same vector they have exactly the same magnitude and direction and that's what defines the vector so it's just now visualized at a different point of application now i will explain this subtraction a bit more in a second but first i'm not done with the addition i want to show you the so-called parallelogram rule so if i'm going to draw now another arrow from the tip of the g vector to this result location then we will have a kind of a parallelogram showing up so this parallelogram right there i don't really like it very much <laughs> i think i want to draw it in a nicer way so please bear with me i'm going to remove these arrows there i just don't like the congestion happening so i'm going to remove these maybe make this result arrow the diagonal of the parallelogram white so i remove that red parameter there and here before that i'm going to draw 
custom shapes. So I'm going to begin a path. I'm going to set a line dash. I want to use dotted lines for this parallelogram. And then let's move to the tip of G first and then go to the result of this addition of the two vectors and then another line to the point, which is the mouse location. And let's stroke and uh, remember to reset this line dash to empty array so it doesn't affect things afterwards. Now, if I'm going to refresh this, this just looks nicer. So the result of addition can be also seen as the diagonal of the parallelogram that you see on screen right now. But what about the subtraction? So let's do the same thing for that. Let's try to make here something like result subtract, maybe something like this, is equal to subtract point g. And let's draw this result vector. So I'm just going to say draw arrow. And um, let's start at 0, 0. This result sub. Now I'm going to refresh. And you can see it there. But too many things are emphasized right now, so I'm going to make the result of the addition red again. And now the only thing that is emphasized in white is the result of the subtraction. So what is this thing, really? Well, if we are going to draw this other line, this other arrow, between the tip of the G vector and the mouse location, it's going to be the same as this one. Let me show you. I'm going to go here and say draw arrow from G to point, the one we control with the mouse. And look at that. They are parallel, so they do have the same angle, and they always have the same magnitude, so they are the same vector. This new one is just applied at a different point. It's drawn at a different point. This is really useful when you want to move something towards something else. But you don't do it like this in, in one shot. You do it in increments. The movement like this is just going to teleport to the destination. So we want to scale this vector down a bit. And I'm going to show you. So let's define the scale function next. This is a little bit different than add and subtract because we have a vector here, but we're going to scale it with a scalar, with a number. So let's call this number scalar, and we return the multiplication of the x and y with this scalar, like so. And now we can call this function up here. And maybe have a scaled sub <laughs> vector. So scaled sub is equal scale result sub, maybe with 0 0.5. So I'm going to scale it by half. And let's draw this scaled sub vector next. I'm going to make red the previous ones so that they are not confusing anymore and i emphasize just this new result next so i'm going to draw an arrow from zero zero and scaled sub this new vector i'm gonna refresh and there it is the white one you can see it's half the size of the original vector that we decided to scale. And this can be useful in some applications, but we could also keep this vector static in length so that the length doesn't change proportional to the 
original one. This is something that could be useful if you want to move at a constant speed, like shooting a gun towards something and then the bullet is going to go at the same speed no matter how hard you press on the trigger. So let's try to do that. And we do it by scaling this by some size that we have in mind, maybe 50, but then dividing by the magnitude of the vector. I'll show you. Let me write this on two lines. So when we divide by the magnitude, if I wouldn't put 50 here, we would get the so-called unit vector or a normalized vector, a vector of length one, because whatever its scale was previously, we just scaled it by one divided by that. So its magnitude became one. But here I'm also multiplying it by 50 at the same time. So if I refresh this, you can see that new white arrow there always has the same size, no matter if uh, the original vector, the red arrow it's drawn on top of, is changing size shorter or longer. So these are actually two operations here, this scaling by 50 and then scaling by 1 divided by the magnitude. This is also called normalization. So let's define a function for that as well and rewrite this code in a bit more formal way. Function normalize p where we scale p by 1 divided by its magnitude. So that's one thing. And then let me let me put here normalize instead like this so i just normalize this this vector and if i refresh now i'm getting an arrow that is really really small it's just a unit vector it's a vector that has a length of one a magnitude of one so i also need to scale this by something previously i had 50 so scale the normalized vector by a value of 50. And we get the same result as previously, but written in a bit more formal way and separating the steps somehow. Now, these are really the most common things I use with vectors, but there's one more I want to show you. I use it sometimes, but I haven't had many videos with it yet. It's the dot product. And I think I should teach you this because then it makes this video a bit more complete. So the dot product is defined like this, P1, P2, and then you return a number. It's not going to return a vector anymore. It will be the product of P1x with P2x added to P1y times P2y. And this result is going to seem a little strange, like what is this number going to be? And that's why we're going to log it in the console to figure out. So let's log the dot product of, for example, that gravity vector and the original point. I'm going to emphasize these two right now. So let me make the new thing here red. I'm not curious in that small vector anymore, the scaled, sub, normalized, whatever. I'm interested again in um, the original ones from the very beginning. So I'm going to make those white, refresh, and that number there, oh, let's make that parallelogram also red, or um, Maybe we can just move these vectors and fall like at the very end here because now they are drawn before the red arrows. So this does everything I want. So now in this situation, that number there, that 60 in this case, weird number, it's the dot product between these two arrows, the white arrows that you see there, the two vectors. So what does it mean? And look at those numbers, they are somehow huge. 
but they seem to drop to zero. They actually drop to zero if I could make this angle between the vectors 90 degrees. So I can't do it exactly, but you can see how it changes from negative to positive here. So really, what this dot product can tell us is if it's zero, then those vectors are orthogonal to each other. They're perpendicular to each other. If it's like a really, really big value like here, then they are in the same direction. And if they are opposite directions, it's also a big value, but negative. So close to zero, zero is when they are orthogonal. And otherwise that value changes. Now you would probably like to apply this dot product on the normalized forms of the vectors. So if I normalize G and normalize the point, Now these would become unit vectors too small to visualize. I'm not visualizing them. I just normalize them before computing the dot product. Then the numbers there are smaller. They are between zero and one. And when the vectors are in the same direction, the number is really, really close to one. I just can't make it one. It should be one if I could put it exactly there. If it's opposite direction, it's minus one. And again, orthogonal or perpendicular, this should be exactly zero. I just can't get it there. So now after normalizing, these numbers are a bit more informative. They just tell us about the angle between the vectors. It's not the actual angle, but it's something that relates to that angle. To get the real value of that angle, you would have to do here, uh, the arc cosine, but I'm not going to get into those things now. I think it's too much. And um, yeah, so this now would be zero in this case. And here we get that familiar um, 1.57, like half of pi. And now here, when they are extended, we get 3.14. So this is pi. And then we start getting um, smaller again. So this gives us the angle in radians. I coded this quite fast to focus on explaining the math, so the code structure could be better. And actually, I don't really know what the best structure is in this case. In other languages, I'd use something like operator overloading, but JavaScript doesn't support that, so I don't know. What do you say? Want to give it a try and improve my code? I'll share it on GitHub, and later I'll choose my favorite updates and present them in a video of some kind. See you guys.